Steve here. It's the show where I answer your question. And my first question this week is about my currently ongoing and atheist read series. And it comes from Ahoyerno who says, Or Ewing is clearly getting on your nerves and you used dishonest for her as well as the previous female apologist. It makes me wonder what kind of woman does it take to be a professional apologist for a patriarchal misogynist religion like Christianity? Well, to be fair to the female apologists out there, it's not as if the other religions exactly offer an alternative as far as that goes. Um, whatever those qualities are, they must be pretty rare because there aren't all that many women working in the field of apologetics. I am interested in like the rationalizations or the mental gymnastics, or maybe just the, the radically different perspective that is required to be a woman in a very patriarchal form of Christianity, as most orthodox forms of Christianity are very patriarchal, very misogynistic, um, and to be playing a role where if you're an apologist, you are taking on the role of, of an evangelist, of a teacher, of an authority, of an interpreter of the scriptures. And those are roles that are, uh, you know, women, it's very frowned upon for women to take those roles. So how do you justify to yourself as a woman uh, taking on a role in your faith that is traditionally, uh, if not outright forbidden or prohibited to you, at least you're, you, People like you are very discouraged from taking on that role. I, I wonder about that sometimes. Kevin Logan, I don't know if you've already answered a question on this topic, but what are your thoughts on the push to add a black stripe and a brown stripe to the top of the rainbow pride flag? Do you think that race and sexuality should be combined in this way? And do you think maybe that the negative reactions to this are overblown whinging? I don't have a problem with adding the black and brown stripes to the flag. I completely understand and agree with the reasons behind it. Um, I don't want to take too strong of a stand either way because I am not a member of either a marginalized racial group or a marginalized uh, gender or, or sexuality group. You know, I mean, I, I, none of the letters in LGBTQ apply to me and neither does the plus sign. Like I'm completely an, an ally uh, and not an actual member of, of any of the groups. Uh, and same thing, obviously, uh, in terms of uh, I'm not a, a black or a brown person. Um, but when black and brown LGBTQ folks say uh, we don't feel like we are fairly represented or heard within LGBTQ plus communities, when we feel like these communities are white dominated and we want to draw attention to that and we want to make a statement about how we need we feel that our communities need to be more inclusive of racial diversity and therefore we're going to put black and brown stripes on the rainbow flag i that makes perfect sense to me and i'm 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 on their side Stephen G. Clinard, I agree with you about Voyager, especially about the lack of consequences from what I've read, particularly the Ronald D. Moore interview. This was intentional. They wanted viewers to be able to watch episodes sporadically and not be confused by continuity or backstory. However, our viewing habits have changed, so we are now more likely to binge watch these series, which in my opinion favors continuity, story arcs, and character development. I think this enhances the strengths of DS9 and highlights the weakness of Voyager compared to viewing weekly episodes. Thoughts? Oh, I, yeah, I agree with you. And I can say from my own experience, uh, I have been binge watching Deep Space Nine for the last several weeks after I finished binging my way through Voyager. And watching them back to back like that, the difference is really striking. Uh, not only the difference in just general quality, because I've always thought that Deep Space Nine was just a way, way better show than than Voyager. Um, but yeah, the 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 ability to craft ongoing, not just ongoing story arcs, but character arcs. Deep Space Nine does get very saga-y in the last two seasons. There are a lot of story arcs where it's almost, even if there's not a to be continued at the end of the episode, it's like a four or a five or a six part series 
Uh, but even before it does that, it, it was always very good at doing character arcs and at establishing that the consequences of something that happened in one episode carried through to future episodes and changed these characters, changed the way they saw each other, changed the way they behaved uh, with each other. And that's something that Voyager was just never very good at. I mean, if you look at the evolution of, like, the friendship of Chief O'Brien and Dr. Bashir, where they were not friends at the beginning of Deep Space Nine, but by the end of Deep Space Nine, they were best friends. They were inseparable. They were like brothers. Uh, whereas with Voyager, you know, Harry Kim and Tom Paris meet on Deep Space Nine before they get aboard the ship. They're basically buddies from the very beginning, and they're buddies all the way through the show, and they're buddies at the end. There, there's not a lot of change and growth in their relationship throughout the series. Um, whereas with Deep Space Nine, there is change and growth and evolution uh, in almost all of the relationships between the characters. And there's a sense that the characters really do know each other and care about each other. Um, that is almost completely absent from Voyager. Sword Shredder. Hey, Steve, do you believe it is okay to take away someone's platform on social media? If so, where is the line drawn when it comes to what platforms should be able to be taken away? It depends on who is doing the taking. I don't think that the government should be telling privately owned social media companies uh, who they should kick off their services and who they should allow. I, I mean, that to me is a violation of the First Amendment and freedom of speech. But uh, the social media platforms themselves should and do have every right to decide who gets to use their platform and who doesn't. You know, YouTube gets to decide who has a YouTube channel. You don't have a constitutional right to have a YouTube channel. YouTube gets to decide. Twitter gets to decide who uses its service. Facebook gets to decide who uses its service. And when they set rules and they set terms of service and community guidelines and people flagrantly and repeatedly violate those rules, then I think the social media platform should kick them off the service, should ban them and say, you're no longer welcome here. We told you the rules. You broke the rules over and over again. So, goodbye. And I, for the life of me, I don't understand why that is a remotely controversial position. Now, as for who gets to decide, um, I have made this point a few times before in my own videos. ContraPoints made this video, or made this point in his most recent video, uh, far better and far more succinctly and eloquently than, than I have, because if you haven't noticed, ContraPoints is, is just a lot better at this than I am. Um, but he said, uh, as long as there are rules, there will be people who, are, who will argue over what the rules should be and who the rules should apply to and how the rules should be enforced. On YouTube, for example, YouTube sets the rules and YouTube has systems and procedures in place to determine whether or not a given user has violated those rules and what the punishment, if any, should be. Now, I personally think that YouTube should be a lot more proactive at removing abusive users, um, but it's, it's ultimately up to YouTube. And again, why this is controversial, I really have no idea. Scott Bressinger, hey Steve, although I agree with you on most everything regarding Voyager, it still holds a special place in my heart. As a bit of a music nerd, okay, music obsessive, I find the main title theme of Voyager to be elegant and memorable. Sometimes I hum it in public. Meanwhile, the abomination that Enterprise called a theme song should be considered a crime against humanity, at least in my humble opinion. What's your opinion of the music in the Trek franchise and how does that affect how you appreciate it? Side question, I plan on watching the upcoming Discovery despite my apprehension about it. Will you be watching it? And if so, what's your CBS All Access password? Sorry, I couldn't resist. Seriously though, keep up the good work. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I do plan to watch Discovery. I look forward to it uh, with great excitement. I, I hope that it's good. I thought the trailer looked promising. I think the things that I have seen and read since Paramount started releasing actual little teasers and information about it sounds really interesting. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and as for the music, I agree with you. I, th I think Voyager's main title theme is great. Uh, my pr the only problem is it doesn't really suit the show. You know, the main title theme is, is, is just majestic and beautiful, you know, and very grand. 
and uh, it suits the opening title sequence. The opening title sequence for Voyager is very well done as well. Um, it's just everything that happens after that in most episodes that is like, oh, God. But the, the music itself is wonderful. And uh, Star Trek music in general is some of my favorite movie and TV music. I think the scores uh, to Star Trek movies and Star Trek episodes are, uh, um, especially in the movie and uh, next-gen era, are really wonderful, with the exception of the main title theme of Enterprise. I agree with you. That was just a huge mistake. Um, but yeah, I, I think, the, for instance, the, the score to uh, Star Trek II is wonderful. The score to Star Trek VI is wonderful. The score to Star Trek First Contact is, is very well done. Uh, the score to J.J. Abrams' Star Trek by uh, Michael Giacchino is just beautiful, is so well done. Um, so yeah, I love a lot of Star Trek music. It's some, it's some of my favorite movie and TV music of all. Crowbro, hey Steve, in the last Atheist Reads, the apologist told an anecdote about a Hindu guru pointing a troubled person to Jesus. This seemed like the most bullshit story ever from an apologist. In all the books you have done for an Atheist Reads, it, there is always at least one anecdote like this. Do you think these stories are 100% fiction or maybe a grain of truth to them? I try really, really hard to give people the benefit of the doubt, so I would assume, unless I have specific reason to believe otherwise, that there is at least some grain of truth to most of them. Although, I, I mean, it's hard to get away from the fact that so many of the apologists that I have read and reviewed in those videos tell such similar stories. I, it hasn't happened for a few series, but remember a couple years ago, for those of you who watched those videos, um, it seemed like almost every book that I did, there was an anecdote about the author meeting an atheist on an airplane or starting up a conversation with an atheist that they just happened to be sitting next to in the airport or the train station or being confronted by an atheist college professor after a talk that they gave or whatever. And the conversations always went exactly the same way with the atheist admitting at the end that, well, you do have a really good point or I can't really argue with that. Um, it just, there's, there's a sameness uh, to those stories that is, makes the whole thing very questionable. I think maybe it might be something related to like the phenomenon where people tell jokes and when, sometimes when people tell jokes, they'll put themselves in the joke. They'll tell the joke from first person, even though it didn't actually happen to them and probably didn't actually happen to anybody. But it's just more interesting and it's more grabbing of the audience's attention if you tell the story as though you were there and it's something that happened to you. I think it's probably something like that where the apologist heard a story like this from somebody else and they decided to include that story in their narrative and they just plugged themselves into the story uh, because it just sounds better that way. Um, maybe it's something like that, or it's sort of like a telephone game thing. We're like, oh, I heard that this happened to this guy, so I'm gonna go ahead and tell the same story, but I'm gonna tell it as though it happened to me. It's probably something like that. If you dig down to the very bottom of it, there's probably some tiny, minuscule little grain of truth to it. But uh, given how similar all of the stories are to each other, it's, it's unlikely in my mind that every single apologist who tells that same story had that identical experience exactly the way they tell it. James Russell, Steve just listened to your guest appearance on I Doubt It, and I was struck by something Jesse said about being gifted Lee Strobel's Case for Christ by Christians who believed it was the single book that could really convert the non-believer. And it made me wonder, is the whole field of Christian apologetics like a tacit admission that the Bible isn't enough somehow? i.e. if Christianity were true, then the Bible alone should be sufficient to make people believe it, but apparently it isn't sufficient, whereas somehow Lee Strobel is? And does it indicate a certain arrogance in apologetic authors that they seem to think they can succeed where the sacred text of their own religion can't? That is a really good point. If you, if you look at the amount of extra-biblical literature that has been written over the centuries, in defense of the Bible or for the purpose of convincing people that Christianity is true or that the Bible is true. Um, I mean, it's, it's just a mountain of, of extraneous material. There are so many extra-biblical books written about 
why the Bible is true or why Christianity is true or why Jesus really lived and did the things the Bible says he did, that it doesn't speak at all well for the persuasive power of the Bible. You would think if the Bible were truly the Word of God and were truly divinely inspired, as, as Christians believe it is, that it would be a lot more persuasive and a lot more compelling and you wouldn't need to do the supplemental reading. Now, in practice, is it kind of arrogant to say, well, if you weren't convinced by the Bible, you'll be convinced by my book? Yeah. If you believe the Bible is the Word of God, <laughs> and you say, well, that didn't get the job done, but I wrote this book, and I think this is really going to crack it for you. I, yeah, yeah, it, it comes across as a little arrogant, maybe thoughtlessly arrogant, not intentionally, not, not indicative of any real arrogance on the part of the writer, but, I mean, if you really believe that the Bible is the Word of God, what are you doing saying, yeah, that didn't quite work, but this, I got this. I got a better argument than this, you know. Um, doesn't quite fit, does it? <sighs> but I tell you what does fit. The first section of the video, it fits just perfectly into this portion. That makes no sense at all. Now I'm not only blowing segues, I'm, I'm blowing lead-ups to non-segues. This is this has just gone completely off the rails. I really shouldn't have tried to knit those together. I should have just I should have just cut my losses after the sound effect and I should have just said, you know what, that was the last question of the main part of the video. It's time now for the next part of the video, which is a little something I like to call the lightning round. That's what I should have done, but I chattered and babbled and fucked it all up. Onward and upward, mild fry. Why do people quip that Bakula killed the series? I too loved Enterprise. Oh, 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 I never said I loved Enterprise. I love Scott Bakula, and I cut Enterprise a lot of slack because of the Bakula factor. I do not. I don't love Enterprise. Don't spread that around. Don't let the other Trekkies hear that. <laughs> Nostra Vinci. What are your three favorite YouTube channels? Oh, my buddy Jason Harding. Jason with a D. That's number one. Um, an old favorite, Red Letter Media, that I still really enjoy and get a kick out of. And uh, coming up really strong lately, who has been really just kicking ass all over the place, uh, ContraPoints. ContraPoints has been killing it in the last couple of months. So that's uh, my top three at the moment. Tony Black, question. In Voyager, Kess's people, we learn, only live for around seven years and only generally have one child. Is it me or does the math not work? The Ocampa would die out in a very few generations, and had they decided to keep Kess as a character, what would they do about her obvious aging process? Yeah, the math doesn't work. I think other folks have pointed that out as well. If they only if if they can only have one child per parent couple, then uh, you can't really build uh, a sustainable population that way. Um, and as for what they would have done about her aging process if she had stayed on the show, I imagine they would have written themselves out of that somehow. I don't imagine Jennifer Lien, uh wearing middle-aged or old-age makeup in like season seven of Voyager. I think if she had remained a regular character uh, on the show, they would have come up with some excuse why Kess didn't age. She would have transcended, you know, her Ocompan nature somehow to stay youthful. Uh, Lucas Hackett, yo Steve, suppose you don't have a car to go to work today. Which one of these legendary vehicles would you choose to ride to work instead? The General Lee, the Mystery Machine, the Ecto-1 from Ghostbusters, the Go-Karts from Mario Kart, or Kit from Knight Rider? Oh, Kit from Knight Rider, no question. Um, I might take the General Lee as far as the cliff that I would then push it the fuck over. But in terms of wanting one of those cars to drive around or drive back and forth to places I had to go, yeah, Kit. No contest. Uh, Kaboom Splat Yuck. Dear Steve, is it hard to be humble when you are perfect in every way? Lord knows it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best that I can. Hazen, is mankind going to kill itself in the end? Probably. Or alternatively, uh, the earth will kill us. The earth will finally just have enough and swallow us up. And five minutes later, it'll be like we were never even here. And all the other creatures that survive our extinction will be like, yes, it's so much better now. Uh, Bruce Bardup, I know you're boycotting DC movies, but Wonder Woman is wonderful. Can you be tempted? Um, it is tempting because I'm very happy to hear from most people who have seen it that it is a really good movie. And I'm happy to see that it's doing so well at the box office. And it is probably going to wind up being the most, the highest grossing of the DCEU films to date. I, I, I really hope that that happens. 
Um, but no, I'm probably not going to see it in the theater. I'll wait until it comes out on, on video and I'll rent it on Amazon or watch it on Netflix or something. I'm not going to go to the theater to see it, most likely. Samuel Sturgill, Steve, you said you like video games, so what games do you like? Uh, it would be more accurate to say I liked video games. I mean, I still like video games in general. Like, I have nothing against video games as a, a medium, but I haven't been a real regular video game player for a long time. I've said before, I think the last uh, console I owned was a PlayStation 2, and that was like 15 years ago. Um, when I had my PlayStation 2, I was really into Resident Evil, and I played uh, a couple of the Grand Theft Auto games. I, I, I had Vice City and San Andreas, and I, I got a kick out of those. Um, I played a lot of wrestling games. Like At the time, this was before the WWE 2K series. They were still, their main series was Raw vs. SmackDown, and I, I really enjoyed that. Um, uh, baseball games, you know, but other that, that those were basically the objects of my my gaming such as it was. Uh, Johnny the Wolf, Steve, what do you think of feminists and allies using gendered slurs? Should it be overlooked on the basis that nobody can be perfect and they're ultimately doing more good than bad or do you think we should be more critical of them and eventually distance ourselves from them? Should they keep doing it? I think it it needs to be considered on a case by case basis. Uh, in general, I mean, I, I try to avoid using gendered slurs, and I don't find it that much of a challenge to avoid using them. And I do wish that others would make the same effort and try to avoid using gendered slurs. Um, but I think you have to say on a case-by-case -case basis. I'm not comfortable saying that anyone who uses inappropriate language should be, you know, ignored or, or distanced. Um, it, it depends. But I think as a general rule that we should try to avoid using gendered slurs because it's not that difficult, in my experience. Uh, Vitamin W, thanks for the D-Wad answer. That adds a plot twist extra layer to the canon. Are you going to call him J-Wad? I think just for a switch, um, I'll call him Jason. Just because I think that's kind of kooky, you know? Or maybe, I'll, I'll, you know what I'll do? I'll, call, I'll start calling him son. I'll start calling him my son, even though he's like 10 years older than me. That could be fun. Or Jason. Uh, Shrikes27, hey Steve, any thoughts on Ted Nugent's recent comments about toning down the hateful rhetoric in our country? I always welcome these kinds of statements from public figures, but given Nugent's vile, hateful comments regarding Obama, Clinton, and liberal Americans, and that he finally stated that at the tender age of 69, my wife has convinced me I just can't use those harsh terms, only after the shooting at a Republican congressional baseball practice, I think I'll take his new shift with a large grain of salt. Am I being unfair? No, not at all. I think you're being completely fair. Show, don't tell. Give him a chance to demonstrate that he has really changed. Give him a chance to show us that he's not going to talk that way anymore and that he's going to call out people and speak out against people who do talk that way, particularly on his own side. Give him a chance to show us that he's really changed and really turned over a new leaf. And if he has, then good for him. But, you know, wait for him to show you. Withhold judgment until he shows you. And if it turns out he's just blowing hot air and he doesn't really mean it and he goes back to talking the way he always talked and using the, that exact same kind of hateful rhetoric, well then to hell with him. But give him a chance. Let him sink or swim. I think that's, I think that's fair. Uh, Radical Bacon. Why do people keep making drama videos about you? You never respond to them, hardly acknowledge the existence of them, and yet they keep showing up in my related videos. You just keep drinking your coffee and making five decently produced videos a week. What's your secret? I think because they are so self-centered um, and they truly believe that their audiences are the only audience and that the world revolves around them, uh, that they, they interpret me completely ignoring them as playing hard to get somehow. I mean, uh, Chrissyosity and a few other people have said that they, they, they behave toward me like someone who is obsessed with an ex, except I'm not their ex. We never went out. We never had any relationship at all. It's, it's, it's weirdly obsessive behavior, I think. Um, but it's probably that. It's, it's you know, um, like in uh, uh, Dumb and Dumber, when Lauren Holly's character says to Jim Carrey, you know, there's, ab there, there's like a one in a million chance that we'll ever get together. And Jim Carrey says, so you're saying there's a chance. It's like that. Except I'm not saying that there is a chance. I'm saying there's no chance. And their response is, so there's a chance. You know, and it's also that they just, they're not creative people. 
They don't know how to make videos unless they're targeting someone and attacking someone. They have one trick. They have one act, and that's all they know how to do, and they copy each other, and that's what they do. And I, I just, I'm not interested in doing that. I'd rather work on my shit than work on their shit because I can write and I can express opinions that go beyond regurgitating tired ass old white nationalist and anti-feminist boilerplate. And I can write a joke that doesn't work on the premise of denigrating or dehumanizing someone. Um, so I'd rather work on my shit than work on their shit. All they know how to do is work on their shit and their shit is one note. So that's what they do. And they attack me and they attack Anita Sarkeesian and they attack Cat Black and Francesca Ramsey and Christy Winters and Kevin Logan. And you know, that's, that's what they do. They make videos attacking people and belittling people because that's their only fucking monkey trick. And I'm just not, I'm just not interested in paying the least bit of attention to that. <laughs> that was the last question. That's it for the questions. It's time now for the shout out. As you know, June is Pride Month. And in recognition of that, all of my shout outs this month will be for organizations that are LGBTQ plus related. And this week, the shout out goes to Native Out, which is an organization that is a part of the Native American, Indigenous and First Nations LGBTQ plus community. And I'm linking you to Native Out's Facebook page in the description, which is a great place to go. Um, to uh, see what sort of events are taking place within the sphere of LGBTQ plus Native American and indigenous and First Nations groups. Um, it's a really, really wonderful corner of the LGBTQ plus activist community. Um, a lot of things you can learn from studying and listening to those folks. Um, and for instance, people still like to argue about how many genders there are, and they treat this idea that, there, that gender is a non-binary, like somehow it's this recent uh, idea that Tumblr feminists or Tumblr trans activists just made it up a couple years ago. Um, there are Native American tribes who have recognized the existence of three or four or more genders for longer than there have been white people living on this continent. It's not a new idea. Now, it's not a universal idea. Not, not every Native American tribe uh, has exactly the same ideas about gender roles or the number of genders or whatever, but there are some that see nothing unusual at all about there being more than two genders and have built their societies with that in mind for many, 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 many generations. It is by no means a new idea at all. And anyone who tells you that it is, is talking out of their ass and doesn't know what they're talking about. So check out the uh, Native Out Facebook page. Uh, look into some of the organizations and events that are being held in support of the Native and Indigenous and First Nations LGBTQ plus community. It is a wonderful uh, shade of that rainbow that deserves some attention. So there you go, Native Out. That's the shout out. I also want to remind you, as I always do at this time, to check out the Let Me Listen family of podcasts. These are podcasts that are created by my very good friend, Jason Harding, AKA Jason with a J. Um, and you should pay special attention to the Late Seating Podcast, which is a podcast that Jason co-hosts with me, where we take a fresh look at a classic movie, a movie that has a reputation for either being great or terrible, we summarize it, we make fun of it for your amusement, and we decide for ourselves whether it deserves its reputation, whatever that reputation may be. And today, this very day that this video is published, you can listen to our newest episode of Late Seating, which is our review of the classic Walt Disney uh, family western pioneer adventure film, Old Yeller, our first dog movie and really probably the most famous of all the dog movies. Our review of Old Yeller is up. You can listen to that. You can listen to all of our past episodes and all of the episodes of all of the awesome Lemmy Listen podcasts by going to lemmylistenpodcast.com. And I don't think you'll be sorry if you do. That's it for me, everybody. I am out of here. Uh, before I go, I want to remind you to please leave a comment on this video asking me your question for next time. You can ask me anything about anything. Nothing is too serious. Nothing is too silly. I will answer as many of your questions as I possibly can, but in order for me to do that, you have to ask. So please do leave a comment on this video to ask a question for the next You Had to Ask video. I'm out of here, folks. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Take care. 
One more thing before I go, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe. And also, please consider helping me to make more videos like this one by supporting this channel through Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash steepshives to become a patron of this channel. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.